But if we do the right things with our teams, our impact will be seen through many generations. So, Israel, will you introduce yourself to our listeners, please? Yes. My name is Israel Santi Esteban. I'm the Vice President of North America Procurement at the Kraft Heinz Company. I love your story and I love your, your grit. And I love how you got to the position that you're in. And I, I would like you to share that with our listeners and kind of describe how you came to be where you are at Kraft. Wow, yes. Th there is not an easy answer to it, but um, I was born in Mexico, Mexico City, uh, speaking only Spanish, so English was a, an addition in later stages of life. And I started working really um, to, to make sure that I was having a purpose in life. And purpose in life for me was through food. I love food and I love people and wanted to make sure that I was touching as much people through food. Nutrition for me was uh, something that growing up, it was quite difficult. I had anemia. I started suffering from other uh, situations, lacking of nutrients, similar situation that you see today. But of course, back in the day, there was not so much information about it. So uh, I started playing soccer in semi-professional teams. At the end, I turned into professional soccer player where I could see how nutrients that I was not having were affecting my performance. So later, of course, I joined um, a company, uh, a French company, Danone. Uh, so I started working there. That we all might know. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yes. It's a uh, little company, yeah. Functional ingredients, cultures, dairy. Um, I was very happy to join a team that uh, I was the only non-veterinarian and non-agronomist. Really? So in the dairy team managing cows, and they allow me to be a farm manager to know what it is. And dairy, of course, uh, is every day. Uh, every single day of the year. So a farm manager, describe that a little more. So. so I was responsible for the planning of the milk that comes into the factory and everything around uh, the farm. So from the feed, animal welfare, all the antibiotics that they were not supposed to give them, so prevent that, working with um, removing all the hormones that they were adding, RBSTs, good manufacturing practices, and making sure that sustainability was there for the farm. So... At any single point in time, if the farm had an issue, quality issue, I had to travel, take samples, bring them back to the lab and running them and making sure that, uh, you know, we identify the issue to prevent it already from, you know, expanding into the operation. So, so you spent time at the farm with the farmers, mm -hmm. which we both went to Purdue, yes. big agricultural school. And I remember taking a class and, and the etiquette of walking on someone's farm. Like, did, did you feel comfortable with that? Of um, I've been taking opportunities as adventures. Mm -hmm. For me, it was wonderful, right? And, you know, like going and trying to pet the cows and like, can I touch them? Like, so yes, yes. Uh, for me, I felt, uh, you know, I had to take the most out of each opportunity and, and that's what I did. I had a fantastic team that supported me and, and taught me how to do these. Uh, I was very young. And at the time I had lost my mom, so they became my family. And I was working every single Christmas and New Year, you know, making sure that the, the milk uh, went to where it was supposed to be and all that. So I, I really kept focusing on work. Uh, but definitely the team, the support, the training that I got, it was essential for it. Did you have and any siblings? I have one, uh, one big brother, which is actually half my weight. <laughs> <laughs> But it's my big brother, Sergio, yes. <laughs> and now he lives here in Chicago after all these years. So oh, wow. we are uh, bringing the family back. Nice. That must have been hard. I know you had mentioned that your your dad wasn't really in the picture. So losing your mom and you were young. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and I think with those few short years or, you know, there will be never enough years, you know, to let someone go for sure. Mm -hmm. But those short years, uh, she taught me a lot and, and she was a person that never studied. I, I don't believe she finished high school, to be honest. Yeah. She was from rural uh, Acapulco uh, and she was the oldest daughter of a family of seven. Mm. And I'm the youngest my, of seven. Yes. So I know that's a lot. And they were farming coconuts, pulling coconuts from the trees, putting them aside. And there was another company that collected them brought them on a truck to a factory and they were doing edible oils uh, now for mm -hmm. cooking and other things. And 
later in my career, when I actually was invited to join Mid Johnson Infant Formula Company, and they do buy edible oils. Well, I figured out that the company that my grandfather was selling coconut by the piece is actually I was sitting, uh, never sitting with them. Full circle. Full circle. I had to do a non-disclosure, like non-conflict uh, uh, of interest uh, yeah. <laughs> disclosure. So when you were, so Danone was when you were, were you in Mexico still? And yes. With the farmers. And were you still playing soccer or was it went soccer then Danone? So I was playing uh, professional soccer then I decided to quit after six or years on my legs, and probably that's when you asked me about risk and resilience. Yeah. That was the way to get food on my table. So I yeah. kept going and you know, getting better on my surgeries and damaging another thing, meniscus, ACLs, hernias. You need to keep going. I, I, when I was researching you, I saw the four ACLs and meniscus. And I yes. don't, did I mention you? My son just had that. So yeah, when I, I was telling him, I'm like, this man I'm meeting in Israel had four, so <laughs> you're only on one, so that's not bad. But it's not bad, and I made it back to professional. I um, was telling him that I'm like he came back, so yes, it's and now yes. you're bodybuilding too. Yes, so. and I decided to retire actively, and I traded my soccer skills for uh, studies in, in college. So I studied industrial and systems engineering, while at the same time I was doing my internship in Danone. Okay, so that's how everything uh, unfolded. Uh, I ended in Danone. I do not have anyone in my family that was from corporate world. So all this is new. And then again, you seem I'm happy because I will take the most out of any opportunity, right? Right. So how to, to, to learn the corporate world? And especially, you know, in a French company. Well, I started studying French. So I took four years of French. And I think I took the right decision when they told me, do you want to do business French or uh, poetry? So like poetry. You know? Yes. And you <laughs> speak that to your wife, lovely, I'm sure, lovely. all the time. It's, it's, yes. It is the most beautiful language. It's so yes, pretty. Yes, yes. So that's, uh, you know, when, when a classmate said that they were recruiting for uh, interns. And it was not my friend. It was a classmate. And I went and said, like, how do I apply? So like, oh, this is the email from the HR person. So I grow to the HR person and they, they grow back to me. 17 interviews later, I was hired. 17. <laughs> one in French, one in English. <laughs> wow. Yes, yes, yes. It was a very nice program, young talent uh, mm. program, a rotational for two years. I completed it in one. And they then, my theory I described, they, they threw me into the most extreme scenarios go plant the milk, the most important yeah. material uh, and critical material for the company, and then come back. At the time, the Mexican facility was the largest dairy facility of the company before they acquired uh, other businesses. So oh. I was very proud of it and managing, learning uh, from, from farmers. You learn to do business in a different way to connect to people because they are families and they are very large businesses. So you do not talk to them as if you talk to a public corporation. You need to learn that this is affecting their family. Like they might not be able to go on vacation because you are throwing another corval at them, saying that you are not going to take all the milk or like. So uh, there is a lot, of, a lot to take on on those relationships, and I learn a lot from that experience. Mm -hmm. And then managing, you know, dry all, all the, the the milk components. You know, you can take whole milk powder, you can take non-fat dry milk. Then I started understanding later from my transition into infant formula, how it was the global markets in New Zealand, Australia, China, Ireland. In 2015, I was there at the abolition of the milk production quota in Europe. Mm. So I was celebrating with the farmers as well. You know, I was there, I need to take advantage of the celebration, right? Like uh, enjoying wow. those key events that I look back and I say like, wow, we had a European commissioner of agriculture present, prime ministers, and I was not even 30 years old, but, um, Definitely, I was very, very lucky to have the right people professionally in my career and in my personal life. Mentoring you. And I do, you know, of course, we at Ed Long believe dairy is complex, of course. And I love, we do some flavor classes where we have customers taste like different milk from New Zealand and Ireland. Oh, yeah. And it's just amazing. So grass fed, grass -fed versus, versus grain. Isn't and, that mm -hmm, cool? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's taste. common sense, but. And I'm a food scientist, so that kind of stuff I love. And you sound like you've got some food science in you. Or maybe you learned on the job. 
Learn on the job, and, and I'm a fast learner and a very curious person. Yes. So I investigate and I prepare and, and you know, I, I, I need to, you know, fully squeeze all the knowledge from each uh, instance and, and operation and, and all that. So, yes, uh, I can tell you that the, the fatty acid chains in, gra- in grain versus feed are completely different. That's impressive. Yeah. I'm going to quiz you on some fatty acid chains. <laughs> so... I loved when you I when I was looking you up to and you were talking about you never went on for your masters but you would take your friends books. So talk about that back to your learner yes, aspect. Yes, I mean who reads textbooks? Like there were for the no, fun uh, of it. Like yes, there's nobody yes. does that. <laughs> yes, I know and I said I need to if I can you know just take for a week you know your books and like go through the topics and Talking about marketing, legal, uh, administration concepts, advanced man- management principles, and uh, negotiation strategies. So I all learned that by myself. That's and huge. It's huge. And now I have the opportunity to do lunch and learns with teams and, and tell them how they should be negotiating or different techniques to use different levers and what is a most desirable outcome, less acceptable, the best alternatives to a negotiated agreement. And then you, if you don't have any of that, play your poker face. You yeah, know, like, yeah, so. yeah. Nothing wrong with a little poker face. <laughs> yeah, like, so then ha- tell me how you ended up getting to the United States. So so you were still at and Danone, Danone, then, Danone. I never know which, which way do they like it, Danone, Dana? Well, it's French, so they say Danone. Danone. <laughs> And I'm French, so let's go to Nome. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, at the point in my life where I had lost a lot in my personal life. So I didn't know where my brother was, my father, you know, my mom. I knew where she was, but of course, you know, mm. I had to go um, get flowers every time, right? Right. Um, so I met my wife and I fall in love immediately. And the team knew it because it's like, Israel, you're now coming into the office at 8 a.m., why is it not 6 a.m. anymore? I having coffee in the morning with a girl I met. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the, the most honest uh, uh, excuse, but it was the truth. Uh, and I fall in love immediately with her. How so did you meet? We met in, in a party through m- mutual friends. Okay. Um, it was her party and I crashed uh, the party. And she asked me, like, what are you doing here? So like, having fun, squeezing every single tear of joy that I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, uh, it ended being a wonderful night that uh, we spoke about adopting kids and future of, you know, how we understood society and life and values and family. And, and uh, it was end of November, I remember, and she invited, to, she invited me to spend uh, Christmas at her house the day I met her. So I was like, wow, that's new. That's, <laughs> that's a good different. sign. That's a good sign. Yes. She's interested. Yes, yes, yes. So probably three months after we met, I proposed. Three months that's brave. Then I went and asked for a salary increase. Uh, Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which was the client. <laughs> 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 so I had to look for another job in order to, to make sure I was not just having my poker face with my wife saying that I was going to pay for an apartment and we were going to have a life, right? So, yeah. And I could pay the wedding, right? So uh, lucky me at the time, uh, Mitch Johnson was looking for a senior manager for a, a Latin America zone responsible for dairy ingredients, everything that I had done in powders, in dairy, and, and Danon paid back at the time all the knowledge. So I joined uh, Mid Johnson with the intention to build uh, infant formula of the future and how babies were going to take the first nutrients, how they were going to actually survive uh, some of those uh, immune system deficiencies. And for me, it was key. Speaking to my wife, we all want to have babies and right. we were pretty much about having a big family and a lot of kids and adopting even more. So nutrition came with the discussion. So for me, it was well-rounded and um, I ended up joining Mitch Johnson um, as a senior manager and driving uh, an acquisition, uh, driving joint ventures in Latin America, resetting supply chains to be more efficient. Uh, that it started to catch the eye of a global chief procurement officer of the company mm. who was another person um, together with my current manager, Mitch Johnson, at the time that he was coming from, a Mexican coming from Indiana uh, back to Mexico. Mm-hmm. And he identified there was a potential and said, like, Israel, I think you need to talk to this person. And he set a meeting with the chief procurement officer who at the time was really satisfied with my work. 
So they extended me an offer to come to the U.S. as a global director. Nice. So I told my wife, we just got married, but we now, because yes, three months engaged and a year after we met, we were married. Wow. And it was the right time because uh, we were eligible for uh, intercompany visa, me as an employee L1, my wife as an L2. Mm -hmm. So she didn't have a visa to come to the U.S. Uh, and the first time that she landed, it was to stay. So we landed in the middle of the Midwest, uh, Evansville, Indiana, and, mm -hmm. and, and she said, huh, this is the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a week later we came to the, the office flag, here in Chicago. <laughs> a, little, <laughs> a lot of corn. Uh, yeah, a lot, a of, lot corn. of corn. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, And she, what I heard, she didn't speak any English at that time. I love the story of the woman in the hotel you got oh, to tell. Yes, I love yes, that yes. story. Our dear friend and now godmother of my kids. Yes. I was very nervous because I landed literally on a Wednesday night. I rented a car. I didn't have my phone because that was a company phone in Mexico. So I literally had one of those old, uh, you know, those, maps. Yeah. And I was driving <laughs> down to the hotel. Um, and then we found a room. And I was nervous because next morning I had to go to the office and my wife was going to stay at the, the hotel. And I said, well, there's breakfast. But she didn't want to come down and speak to a person that will not understand and be exposed to, to, to a different environment. And when I was having my coffee before going to, to, to the office, uh, I look up and I, I saw the girl say like, by any chance, do you speak Spanish? And she told me, yes, I'm from Peru. And I'm like, thank you. My wife will come down and we'll look for you. So I called her from my office to the hotel room and said, you can go down. There's a Peruvian lady there, Karin. And then uh, they spent probably Five hours talking. <laughs> so that, that was the best so start fantastic. for us. It was probably like, oh, thank God. Yeah, yes, that, yes, that would be, I, I am always so impressed of, of people that come to this country or any country and don't know the language and, and, and learn it. And it's, it's, I mean, I've been to Mexico many times and there's times you're at places where they don't speak English and it's, you, you do like sign language and you try to like figure out how to communicate, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's a headache for six months before you start dreaming in the new language. Six that's months when, only? Really? That's when you start to realize that, yeah, this is uh, the, the, the time it takes the brain to adapt to a new language. Yeah. So she became the godmother of your children. Yes, and yes. Uh, ultimately. Uh, there's more to that story. Um, she was studying. She was working, uh, similar to, to her husband. She had a three or four year old son that uh, she couldn't uh, put in a daycare for a day or something. And we were still guests of the, the hotel and she asked my wife if she could. Well, actually, I think my wife was the one offering like, I can stay with your son. I and can like, babysit Well, you, just, yeah. So she was babysitting uh, So Isaac. it was like a win-win and, you know, take care of each other and help each other. Yes, in that small community. So we are still today in contact and they send gifts every single year to my kids and we get together and we remember all Isn't those it days. It's amazing how you can meet people that are going to be a part of your life forever. It's very... But you seem very open to that. So very open. And, and that's probably the thing in my life that has paid back the most. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, the, the, the husband of Karim, American, mm -hmm. uh, he taught me a lot. He said, in America, it's not who has more, it's who needs less. And I've been living through that value and that idea, uh, you know, mm -hmm. till today. Like, do you need it? You know, no. But if you want, if you can pay it, sure, buy it. But it's not 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 about what you need. It's about uh, not needing much. You know, like living, uh, you know, with that purpose and, and that um, mantra. I will say, um, he invited us to. He said a deer party. I understood a beer party. I show up with a six pack of beer. <laughs> it was hunting season, which for me was completely unknown. Right. So we, we got to the house and girls were in the kitchen, uh, you know, like preparing some other stuff. And, and she said, uh, the, the, the wife, like, oh, they are in the, the, the barn. Okay. So I walked to the barn with my beer and then they were like opening deers oh, and wow. processing the meat to and do burgers like, and this and that. Uh, so uh, it was a shock to come I've from. never heard of a deer party. I would not know what that is either. But I, I got to know uh, venison, which is one of the most delicious dishes good. and... I like venison stew with a little red wine and like it's that's really good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so then now you are 
five years in Indiana. Five years and you had I got to... my green card sponsored by this uh, wonderful gentleman as well, uh, Jose Feito. Um, he is son of Cuban refugees. Ah. He does not speak Spanish. He grew up here in Chicago, but he knew how life was back then. And he saw an opportunity and he once asked me like, Israel, are you interested in a green card? So let me, th of course, like, you know, what are you talking about? That'll be amazing. So he sponsored through the company my, my green card. Uh, and then when he left the company and, um, you know, the merger or the acquisition actually of Mid Johnson happened, mm -hmm. uh, I had other opportunities to stay in the U.S. or to go with the company to either Amsterdam or Singapore. But we had the twins already and we thought that the U.S. was the most wonderful place to grow a family. And we decided to play our chances and stay. Mm -hmm. It was rough. Um, I will not say that it was easy. Uh, but it worked out well at the end. And mm -hmm. a few of those months, I would say, and years, um, I was really stressed. Yeah. So understanding from an intercompany visa that only allows you to stay in the U.S., if you work for that company. Right. Once I tried to work at a gym on a weekend, uh, like, or weekends, I couldn't because my work visa was only allowing me to work for that company. Yeah. So, so then you feel, you know, kind of like trapped or, or that you could be... Limited, I will say, to some extent. Yeah, um, however, if you are to be terminated by a company, you have a certain amount of days to leave the country. That's you can no longer stay here. I mean, and you have a house and kids and like, how are you going to leave in days? Yes. So you can leave and if you have a tourist visa, you can come back. And, and get your stuff, more in or less. My, in the case of my wife, she didn't have a, a tourist visa. Uh -huh. So that was a lot of stress uh, yeah. through the years. But with a green card, you know, it was like a little bit more of a relief. Um, right. That I could go out and, and Like settle, work. really, and like settle in, yes. you know. Yeah. Yes, yes, and have more certainty on our future. Um, then we moved to Denver. Denver, um, and then my wife learned in um, Indiana, you know, from this wonderful group of, as well of uh, Tea Time. They were actually a local uh, ladies in the community were organizing uh, conversational for non-English speakers. So her first um, uh, English experience conversational was through this group. And, and she was so happy and thankful, and, and I think she cooked for them, and they did uh, pumpkin cravings, so she knew all that. She, she learned all that from, from that group. When we moved to Denver, there was not such group. Okay. So she identified an opportunity to bring a, a, a group together with affinity of Latin moms in Denver. So he, she created that group, and for me, it was another scared time, because she told me, like, I will have people coming over to the house. Like, who? Uh, people I met online, so like, tell me more. Yeah, they're going to come like 10, you know, moms with kids. So I was like, moms with baby, okay. I will stay in the, the, the next street, like, just hanging out and see if you need anything, you just call me. Yeah. But everything went well. We, we met um, a lot of wonderful souls in Denver and families and uh, that have become part of our life. Mm. And, and my wife still today, Eight years, probably eight or more years later, the group is still there. We have moved out, but yeah. she has tremendous ambassadors that are keeping the purpose alive. It's because it's important. I mean, she lived through that and knows like how hard it would be to come to a country with, especially with young kids and not being able to. I think that's a that was a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. it should be in every and all the story times that libraries offer for free anything for medical services that they might also need in their life, schools, uh, mm -hmm. activities in town, uh, everything for, for, for kids to enjoy, mm -hmm. play days that they organize. And um, also the most important night of each month, it was the Latin Moms Night Out. Oh, so yes, that is the most important <laughs> night of the month. <laughs> the, the husbands we needed to stay with the kids and then they were able to f go out and enjoy, which for also expats in included, it's essential, like sometimes executive can adapt to the work and you are in, at work, you are in your element, but the family is out there and if they don't have a support system, we have seen many friends that are struggling with that situation. Mm -hmm. And through this type of groups, you know, the family starts to also adapt, enjoy, 
and support, you know, the, the total uh, family mission of coming to another country. Yeah, you need community and connection. Yes. yes. And it would be incredibly lonely without mm -hmm. that. So Denver for us was two years. Okay. Uh, and I got a, a call from a former supplier. Um, he was soon to be stepping up as CEO of an organization. And he told me, Israel, I enjoy so much discussing and arguing and negotiating with you uh, that I need someone like you to run uh, my supply chain and procurement. So I was thrilled to move to Cleveland, uh, mm -hmm. working in uh, fruit preparations, mainly for yogurt, bakery, food service, and transform an organization. That was uh, what in most recent years has been my passion to work with people, understand that this world is changing and the, the pace of change is accelerating tremendously. We see it. Uh, we have many events that are converging at the same time, never so close to each other. Mm -hmm. We have had, uh, you know, real estate crisis, uh, health crisis, war crisis, like now it's everything together. All the weather patterns. I was going to say like, weather, yeah. It's another Supply one. Supply chain definitely has had a lot of challenges in the last probably four or five years, right? Correct. It's been one thing after another. And it has shaped the consumer of the future that is now taking the post-COVID era. I call 2023 the COVID hangover. There are still some things like hybrid, hybrid work model, right, that we didn't have before pandemic. We're still having less and less, but, you know, we still have it. And, and that flexibility around managing your day and your week, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's much improved. And I think mental health is another portion that is now at the forefront of um, engagement and employee experience and managing talent performance. So those are things that I believe um, we can take on, and, and together with the agility to make things happen. When you have no option, you do it. Right. And we did a lot of things that we thought it was going to take years in months or weeks. When we were forced to, totally Correct. agree. Correct. I think that was the silver lining for sure of, of what we all went through in COVID. And I still have like PTSD over the whole thing. It was so, mm -hmm. it was so hard. Yes. How are you guys handling, how are you at Kraft handling the, the hybrid? And you know, I, yeah, the younger generation definitely has an opinion. We have a, a flexible policy. We normally like to see people in the office three days a week. Mm -hmm. We have core days and one flexible. It, the reality is that we are allowing employees to take care of their dimension of life. We now don't anymore say that there's a personal and a professional life. It's your life. It's only one, it's mm -hmm. only you. So we now have learned that there's five dimensions in life. And, and you know, family, community for sure, spirituality, health, and your professional life. Uh, play a balance and if one is not okay, we'll drag one or two more with it. If two are not okay, most likely the other three will be impacted. Mm -hmm. So we encourage employees to be active managing their, their health, mental health and physical. Uh, what I've seen in reality is that if I come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to the office, there's not a single desk open. We have an open desk policy, first come, first serve. So if you come at 10, it doesn't matter who you are, you will find it hard to to to, to I to saw that on the pre-call plan you did with Simply B, and you're like, I'm trying to find an office. Like, <laughs> yes. there's got to be one here somewhere. That was a regular. Uh, well, Tuesday. that's kind of in a way a good sign to me. I mean, I'm, that means that a lot of people are in, and I think longing for a community back to you know even your chat about Denver and you know mm -hmm. people really wanting that community. I feel the same at Ed Long. It's uh finding opportunities for us to get together. Yes. And even play. Play's been the word that we've been talking about that a little bit today of a, you know, what wellness looks like even in corporations yeah. now has to have a component of play. Totally. Um, we say that we need, and we need to have fun as well while we do it because we are dealing with very serious business, but joy and, and fun and, and rewards and you know, needs to be there. Mm -hmm. We need to, to definitely have that portion of, uh, you know, the, the, the fulfillment. And Purpose. that's for me personally, one of the most important aspects of work. I come up to the building, there's wonderful 76 floors to go that allows you to think a lot and I'm smiling all the way up, I'm smiling all the way down. The only difference at the end of the day is that I'm completely exhausted. Yeah. 
but happy because but happy. we continue to move the the purpose and the purpose is to transform how people eat mm. and how people will be eating in 10 years time from now which is completely different um a, I, I would say purpose of a company two or three four years ago uh, we have started small on like two years ago we were trying the products that we were going to put to market everything is on on the market now uh, now we are starting to 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 craft how the life will be in 10 years which uh, the first reflection it was scary for many of our millennial employees because we said yeah you will be 43 45 and they're like <laughs> what oh my god i will be what do you see though the future of you know what will be and uh, yeah love to hear your you know what, yeah, what so lies ahead Wellness is definitely one of the things, and we are not um, in the supplement side of you know health. Uh, we need to bring function uh, through food, the functional through food, the benefits through food. There is a lot of new factors that are uh, gut health, which are connected to the brain. So there's a lot of science that we are now starting to investigate and the effects of if you fix one thing, maybe you are fixing other. So. The, the part of uh, gut health is uh, super, super important. Uh, I think all the probiotics continue to be relevant. Mm -hmm. I think that people want to have clean nutrients and nutrient dense. And there's a lot of education that we need to do uh, to separate what's the level of processing on a food that might say nothing about if it's good or bad, but if it's nutrient dense, that's the right conversation to have. Right. And there's always a responsibility about the ratios and the, the dietary guidelines uh, that you need to follow. If you are eating enough of this and too much of that, like what that means for your health. Right. So aging population is one of the aspects that is coming new to my uh, attention. So more recently, you know, because also in 10 years, uh, people will start to reach 60 as well. Mm -hmm. And more people will be reaching 60 than today. Right, and this whole population booming, and we talk a lot about food heroes, which we have a vision of making like kind of a consortium of some of us, and you know, what kind of along the lines of legacy, but what is the legacy the food industry wants to leave behind? Because right. right now we are the leaders of it, and, and what can we do to. It's to a help? huge responsibility because. For us in Kraft Heinz, taste will always be a must. This is who we stand, but we need to make sure that that's good for you, that makes you feel good, and to the environment. Right. So huge, huge scale that allows us to be uh, a power player on how agriculture sustainability will continue to preserve and repair this world. I think also that that power sustainability in the past used to be like, do not damage the, the environment, right? Now is let's repair the environment. Let's do regenerative agriculture. Let's do more of the good. Getting back and less to your farming bad. days, right there. Yes, yes. I, I think that is interesting. Learning about that. I'm not any stretch a, a farmer, but you know, you read so much about this regenerative agriculture, mm -hmm. and and even having some of the products that you brought, which I love. But I the and I, I the food industry. I feel like we swing the pendulum. So I've been in it a long time, thirty years plus, but we go one way or the other. And I love when people talk about plant-based as like, you know, not necessarily going vegan or vegetarian or swinging the pendulum that far, but maybe one day a week you eat plant-based and you look at it more of like a balance of, you know, what can I do to help with this? And I find it frustrating sometimes that you try to do something that you think is good and then you find out, lo and behold, almond milk uses a ton of water. And you're like, well, that didn't solve anything, you know. Like, how do you truly correct do the Stay right thing? You to try to do it, but yes, yeah. um, there's of course many streams to work, and one is formulations, right? Understanding your carbon emissions and what products are probably more on the intensity and the total emissions. Uh, then you can discuss as product developers and, and and scientists how to design products that are more carbon friendly uh, carbon friendly right. and doing better for the world yeah and I do believe in science I do believe in especially when we all collaborate together and get some big brains together I think the solutions are there yes and I, I would say it feels like that has gotten in again back in my years of the industry that people are in this industry are way more collaborative than they used to be call it mm -hmm. 10 years ago even do you yes. feel the same I do um 
I think that we still have long ways to go when it comes to regulation. Yeah. That is the, the one point that everyone has good intentions in, in Capitol Hill and, and the House. Mm -hmm. We need to come up as a group to make sure we educate legislators and that we take the right decisions for the population and the world. I'd love you to expand on that. I know that you're on the board for um, IDFA. IDFA. And I was reading about that, that, and you, we were talking, you, you got to go to Congress. So I think that's a powerful thought of how do we come together and educate. So talk a little bit about what you do in, in, in that, with that hat on, with your board right. hat on. So in the IDFA, uh, I'm part of the cheese board and their ingredients board. Uh, what we do is that we have some sessions to represent 95% of the data industry of the nation and we go in front of legislators, uh, Congress people, representatives of the House, and we educate them on topics that are relevant for uh, the people, like SNAP, uh, you know, the, the food stamps. Uh, significant reduction is happening, and then uh, nutrition on the support programs uh, are, are getting, uh, you know, like replaced by lettuce instead of milk when there's not a budgetary restriction. So we go and we say like, this is already a, a sensitive population when it comes to nutrition. So wait, explain SNAP to me a little more, sorry. I don't really know much about it, but how does that so go? So there is a basket of goods okay. that um, it's allowed to be uh, purchased by the, the people that is less um, uh, probably... Like food stamps in a way? Or like, yes, okay. uh, less favorite on, on, on that part. So the content of that food they are replacing milk and then they are adding vegetables like lettuce. Mm -hmm. So when we see that this is a sensitive nutritional deficit population, we go to Congress and we say like, if it's not a budgetary restriction, do keep the milk because milk has more nutrients and amino acids than vegetables. Mm -hmm. So people is less uh, deficient on these nutrients and they need it. And if it's possible, put it out there. So uh, food stamps, uh, the, the SNAP benefits overall, the school meals, they are now bringing 2% milk instead of the 1% that nobody drinks. I heard that. Now That's they're great. putting 2%. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the trade promotional activities, another area that will allow uh, the, their industry to grow in this country because we are maxed. Uh, there is a, a lot of like uh, consumption. The industry cannot supply more because there's either no consumption or no workers here. Mm -hmm. So there is also a Workforce Modernization Act segment that we come and request to have those um, visas, H-2As, to be eligible not only for seasonal, but to, to have them permanently and to add processors because they might get the milk out, but if we don't have workers, we to will drive do nothing. the trucks, to Correct. get it distributed, to, yeah. Correct. So if you see the, the seasonality aspect of that H-2A visa, mm -hmm. uh, dairy farmers, even the, the ones that they have benefit with these workers, they need to train every single year a new set of workers because the workers will need to go back to where they come. And then there is a lot of training and training and training. So the learning curve is a learning curve. So if they stay for two or three years, that could be even a better scenario. That makes total mm -hmm. sense. So with that hat on, you're really changing policy or trying to help change policy or trying to, and, and I love the concept of educating. And I know you know I'm in the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association, which feels in a way similar, but it's um, educating on on the flavor world and, and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's important, important mm -hmm. stuff. Yes, and you can see how uh, I was able to to attend a session with one congresswoman and we were talking about the benefits of having visas for workers to come and I was very mm. proud to show my American passport to her saying their industry was the one that gave me the opportunity to come to this country yeah. and I'm serving proudly to the purpose of growing this business and making sure that Americans are having the best foot forward for nutrition. Yeah. So she was really touched by, uh, of course, the, 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 the sign of, you know, it could be me, you know, like that's, uh, that's the reality. So when are you going to run for office? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can see I, it, know. I can see it. <laughs> it and I think you were talking even about educating them on 
the importance of salt and preservatives and like yes yeah, so sodium reduction yeah. cannot be everywhere eternal. no it's food safety when it comes to cheese yeah so that, that is one of the things that I believe was the, the most powerful statement that we cannot remove it completely because this has a, a food safety component so it's been it's been um, really great to see hardworking people in Congress I will tell yeah. you for the most part is right. it's been evident that they keep trying hard and when you see them spending the nights over there and uh, going through all these bills, farm bill and like, uh, it, it's uh, exciting to see them working. I think the part where they themselves, they get, you know, a little bit frustrated or, or on the downside is that they often have more of a different political agenda and then the ag a great bipartisan proposal falls through the cracks. So that's got to be so frustrating, so much work, and then it. How do you get it across the finish line? I, I, I can't imagine that would be a really soul wrenching job. Sometimes. Yes. There's one thing I want to touch on that we touched on at dinner. The speaker that you guys had in that. So talk about. Oh yes, the the. So it was a leadership. The meeting. brain tattoo. Yeah, that <laughs> yes. was like like I. Yeah, your that word. was so cool. Yeah, your words. So talk about that whole yes um, event. The event, of course, it's a global leadership conference where we have the top 100 executives of the company. And then one of the inspirational aspects of it, it was to craft your own brain tattoo. And they told us about, you know, this is how you should be doing storytelling. So this is a lot about how do you communicate and, and engage and inspire people. Uh, so when you're trying to tell a story, there's many ways to do it, but at the end you need to come down with a power statement. And then when you do it personal and then they ask us to do our own, wow, that's when when hit home, right? Like, oh, it's not that easy. You just need to do like three yeah. words will be enough, but which are those three words that you will be committing to put on a tattoo, let's say. So they, of course, use a Sharpie and... Uh, but that's pretty permanent. That's permanent for a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> write it on your on your on your forearms or uh, your chest or you know there's uh, different um, aspects that they can and, suggest. And what was the process? Uh, did they? I feel like they took you through to get to your word, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. There were uh, there was a process on uh, having a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you know what's the the power statement of it. Uh, when they spoke about like uh, what was the one event that changed your life. Is, is when you start narrowing, uh, you know, to It to was your own emotional story. when you were telling me. I was so teary out of that. Yeah, so. I, I, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to really? do it. Like, I was like, I, you know, like, I'm not going to do this like in front of 100 people. Like, right. You know, and like, I'm a leader and I can't get emotional <laughs> and like, I'm vulnerable. But at the end, that's, I think, you know, what I like about Kraft Heinz, that they ask us, encourage us to be our whole self in the office and to lead authentically and, and, and to learn from, you know, all these situations that, that we don't know. So uh, sharing openly, uh, you know, it's, it's been one of the, with, without any remorse. In, in other companies, I was not even sharing that I do competitive bodybuilding mm -hmm. because no, that's work. Like, you know, that's my personal life. But, you know, like, yeah. but people see me eating all the time and like they yeah. understand, like, you know, I'm going through a process that, you know, so they, they start to pick. Here yeah. they ask me and, and I share and I'm, I'm, you know, quite open here and that's something. You might find different. somebody else that's interested in it. And wants yes, to I, do I have it, heard yeah. a lot of uh, people asking me even for uh, advices on nutrition or longevity. Ah. So that's uh, 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 another part that people connect with you differently. Mm -hmm. So my own brain tattoo. Um, imagine you know after all the bodybuilding stories that they know from me, mm -hmm. I put um, not strong enough, ah. and everyone was like, "Oh come on!" Like so, like hear my story, you know, like I. I was not strong enough to keep keep my mom alive, Ugh. to protect my mom, and and to Can't make sure it. that, you know, she was still here with me. Ooh, and that's... and for me, that's very personal and like that's crazy personal and vulnerable. And I know she is up in heaven, going, "You were strong enough. This wasn't your job." I would like to go with it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That is. Yeah. That's huge. And I think you showing that vulnerability as a leader allows your your whole team to to show that vulnerability. Yes, and to focus on the right things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's no hidden agenda. I think that there's a purpose that we all need to be on board. We need to do our best effort, and that allows you to to really um, 
understand what are the motivators of each person and, and make sure that you know, they get fulfillment at job. Mm -hmm. So there is not one fit all when it comes to leadership. You need to understand individually what do they need from, from, from you? Not mm -hmm. only what can you do for them, because I'm very limited. But if I'm not the best person to tell you how to, you know, run a Monte Carlo financial model, I know someone that will teach you. So if that's what you need, what you need from me is that I will put you in contact and open, you know... Um, Make the connections, the mentoring part. opportunities. Yes. Um, one other very rewarding example I have more recently is that two people from my team will join IDFA Women in Dairy. Ah, first yes, yes. session, first edition uh, in Congress. So that's one of the, the most amazing things I've heard because... The industry needs uh, more representation of female mm. and having the voice heard and having more allies like me, we can make a difference. Absolutely. So that's, uh, uh, the, I, that's I'm the so first important. one coming to them. And I know you were um, commenting on CRAFT's ESG, Environmental Social Govern Governance. Gover mm. Governance. Um, and belief in diversity across all aspects of CRAFT. So talk a little bit about that. So there is a component of supplier diversity where we work with small and disadvantaged um, groups and we have a commitment to triplicate our spend with them. Nice. So we work closely with organizations, um, women in business and minorities mm -hmm. to make sure that that's happening. Uh, we have systems to track and actually a new hire that is revamping the entire uh, program for us with tremendous, tremendous knowledge. Uh, there is a component of the rep demographic representation at work. So we have about 30 people that identify themselves as people of color, mm -hmm. uh, which is an improvement from before 2019 to now. There's many companies that they just took the optic in pandemia due to the protest and now they fall back. Mm -hmm. No, we are still showing progress uh, even before uh, pre-pandemia. Uh, there is a, a, a situation we corrected that now uh, women in leadership, they are at parity 50-50. When I joined four years ago, there was a at least a twenty to thirty percent gap. So there has been a lot of that's movement. fast progress. That's that's fast progress. It's impressive. Um, is it's uh, you live it every day, and and as you can imagine, it's not perfect, but it's mm -hmm. better. Right. Uh, there are groups that are heavier in representation than others. We need to balance. Uh, that's the reality. Uh, but I'm very proud of having all all these. Um, progress in such short amount of time and consistent and sustained. Yeah. When I joined um, FEMA a million years ago, there was only, it was all men that had ever even been on the board and ever been president of FEMA. And uh, so when I got on the board, I think I was the fourth woman on the board. Maybe the sixth, and now I'm the fourth woman president in 125 years. But now the board is 50-50. So it's, it's progress. It is progress. Yes. And I think... You just kind of keep trying to move the needle and, yeah. So do you feel, I wonder if I was thinking as I was kind of reading up about you and like, do you feel a heavy responsibility for the big role that you have and the amount of I nourishing do. the world that you are responsible for? I, I mean, do, I do. We are talking about billions of pounds, billions of dollars. We are working through the scale of massive um, uh, elements. Uh, I do feel the responsibility, but I'm excited about the responsibility. I'll tell you that I never thought I was going to be in, in, in such position because I didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. But when the opportunities are presenting themselves and I have been you know, surrounded by fantastic people that they see potential in me and then they keep pushing me to, to new boundaries. And I will, the, the only promise I have is that I will do my best effort always. If you know that uh, the project didn't go through the negotiation, the situation is not because of lack of effort, passion or grit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might be situations we need to recognize that it's not possible, right? But for the most ex extent of my capacity, I'm fully vested to make sure that this continues to change for better, to improve, to utilize. And, and coming again from Barcelona, an important um, offsite of leadership at the ES University of Navarra in January, 
uh, we were taught that many leaders uh, make the mistake of not utilize fully the position of power that they have to do good. We are afraid mm -hmm. to use our position of visibility to mm -hmm. demonstrate how people should lead, should act, or how you can actually change things in the world. Change the world. So sometimes you are in a position that you don't want to change things, but there's only one life. Yeah. And you need to go and make sure that you validate your assumptions. And if the assumptions are pointing that the business case is the right thing for the world, for your organization, for yourself, mm -hmm. go for it. Go for it and, and make it happen. You will learn something for sure. I love that. I get feedback a lot of um, from my my team that I don't step into my power. So I, I and and using it for good. I mean, I think that's yes. kind of what some of this podcast is about, and yes. using it as a platform for good. So I love that. Mm -hmm. The responsibility of all leaders is to to use that power for good. Yes, and show that others can actually do it. And, yeah, and you bring other people with you as you correct. Correct. So interesting through my life, uh, I wanted to be a professional soccer player to be a good example for kids. You know, that was my main purpose. Then surgeries happened and, you know. Right. It, then I started working in food and I wanted to do good for people. Yeah. And, and well, lead by example. Food is fulfilling. Food is so fulfilling. It's so rewarding. And if you see any moment in your life, food is next to you. Yeah. You know, what do you think is the legacy that we as leaders in this industry should leave behind? What do you think we should focus on as our legacy? People. people. Always people first, people last. Yeah. We will be gone. But if we do the right things with our teams, our impact will be seen through many generations. Mm -hmm. We will be able to lead uh, our teams with the mindset that this is not a finite, finite uh, game. Mm, you right. will have infinite, you know, like mm, right. multiply, uh, multiplying situations on on beneficial ethics, uh, your work ethic, your mm -hmm. your your business ethic, um, your challenging the status quo to get things better. And and quotes that come to my mind, like literally from all these trainings, like if you were to ask, uh, like. Henry Ford, why he was not so much uh, asking people what they wanted. He said, because if I ask them, they will tell me they need faster horses. <laughs> right. So those are the type of things that, you know, if you want to create a legacy, challenge people, but also know that they don't know what they don't know. Right. Show them, develop them, grow them, and be there for them in, in, in the right way, not only in the professional way. I have had one-on-ones that they ask me like, is it really true? Or, or Israel, let me ask you this. How much your life changed when you become a father? That was a direct report of mine. And I was like, what are you doing for the next 20 oh, minutes? Let's right? go down, have a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk. Was this a, a direct report that had any children yet? Uh, they were about to. About to. Yes. And man, right? You can't yes. explain that. Yes. As much well, as like, we try. You will be happy, you will be exhausted, but mostly you will be happy. Yes. <laughs> so that, it's, that's it's a when, love that you can't even describe. Yes, and, and you know, when people ask you about your legacy, you start to feel old. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but, but is there a right thing to do? Like, if I just look back, I have the rare reports in my career that now they lead their own companies. And they are in every single target in the nation. And they are doing good because they have products that they do good with, with those products to, to the health of people. Yeah. Uh, others that are innovating and leading through supplements, sports supplements, mm -hmm. and having better sources of energy with green coffee extracts and, you know, green tea extracts. And like, you know, it's when I see that um, the wars, the challenges, the hurdles, the experiences, have a multiplier effect. Normally, I tend to say that we all have long shadows. And I can see that at least in some small portion, I contributed to those products, those success stories, mm -hmm. and even more to those people that they do not have the access to resources like I did. Mm -hmm. It's still possible to, to, to think big. So I learned that you need to make your plan so ambitious that you get uncomfortable telling small-minded people. Yeah. So if it's not 
exciting you enough, that's not a good plan. That's not going to be your legacy. Mm -hmm. So people um, around, um, I want to go out and, and continue to see the, the news, uh, continue to see the, the shelves, continue to see Isn't there, the there's life. nothing better than being in our world and seeing something on the shelf that we contribute to, right? It's like, you're yes. like I was a piece of that. Like, Yes, Especially, yes and feeling proud. Very proud. That is a very proud moment. And I, I can just tell you, just emit you are a developer of people at your core. And that is like, that's so important. And that, you know, you're planting seeds and they're, and they're growing, you know, and they're growing wherever they might grow. It might be with craft or other places. There is one other co-worker now that um, she's uh, actually born in America from Latin parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been mentoring her for almost two and a half years. Uh, recently promoted and, and she told me, you should have seen my father's face from Colombia, the father, living in Tennessee. And she said that my father told me like once uh, when I came to America, I was cleaning offices at night. Now my daughter leads those meetings in those offices. Oh, So that's my legacy. That's... Uh, what really gets to my uh, to my core is um, developing those people and saying imposter syndrome learn about it learn how to control it mm -hmm. we all go through through the same I say Israel you do this every day every month every week I was still having my thoughts you know <laughs> like, everyone has like, it everyone wow. has it and I was talking to a woman yesterday about you know have a conversation with it I'm like oh, that's brilliant talk to it okay you know maybe that's right And yes. really, uh, instead of resisting it, just it's there. It's there for so many. It's not just a woman thing. Men have it. Yeah. Important aspect as well to understand, and this is again another section of my legacy. I will tell you, being an ally to women that they are growing in life and business. I learn, and, and I don't think this is any news to women, but like for men, I was like, like when female are facing a promotion they tend to feel that they need to know how to do the job. Like for men, I will tell you like, I think I can do it. Right. 20, 30%, I'll get there. I'll figure it because I'm <laughs> a learner. Figure I'll figure out the rest of it. Yes. Yeah. So that's... That's, uh, that's uh, true. Uh, so if I'm promoting a woman, mm -hmm. I work along the lines with that woman and mm -hmm. walk through the emotions, walk through the... The, the, the imposter syndrome right. work through. You are enough. You have the capability to grow. You have growth mindset. Yeah. You will do it. And then yeah. months later, I was like, wow. And, and I've been on those meetings that I, I just joined and see them and I, I'm feeling like a, a proud dad. Yes. And I'm like, not that old. <laughs> that is awesome. There's a traction saying and, and that's that um, operating system that we use. It's like an execution kind of thing. But There's a people analyzer tool and the questions you ask are, do they get it, want it, and have the capacity? And I think that's kind of leads to what you're talking about. It's like the capacity. Doesn't mean you have to know it right now, but do you have the capacity mm -hmm. to get it, want it, and you know, the competence more or less. So that's that's really sound advice to especially for women. I've heard that before too, that we I was lucky enough that my dad threw me in a bunch of positions at Edlong by happenstance, <laughs> I had no idea how to do at the time. But um, what a blessing, you know. I mean, honestly, having those times in my life is when I grew the most. I mean, you just have to kind of jump into the fire and, yes, and, figure, and it out. figure it out. All right, thank you, Israel, so much for spending this time on Owning Your Legacy. It's been it's been awesome. And uh, look forward to doing a little behind the scenes with you and having a little chill conversation with you and your wife. So my thank pleasure. you for being my here. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me.